And then you can blame the food handlers. All right, those are the staphylococci. Let's move to another coccus, streptococci, also gram-positive cocci, growing in pairs or chains, as you can see in this micrograph of the organism. We put them into two groups. There, there are a number of different ways to categorize streptococci. So if you decide by listening to this lecture, you want to go read about streptococci, you may find other classifications. And you will say, Racaniello didn't know what he's talking about. But, but there are just many ways to do it. And so I'm going to tell you one way, because we can't tell you all ways. Uh, and that is as follows. There are group A streptococci, which cause a wide range of clinical diseases. And then there are group B which are leading causes of neonatal sepsis, that is disseminated infections, and meningitis. I like this because it's a very simple classification, and you can remember it. Just like the staphylococci, many people carry streptococci in them as well. This is ubiquitous in the human population. It's worldwide, it's in every country, and it's found on the skin and the nasopharynx your nose and pharyngeal tissues, of about 20% of school-aged children. So if you go to any random classroom in the world, about 20% of those kids have this bacteria, the streptococci, on and in them. And when you do carry streptococci, usually you're okay. We say you're asymptomatic. You're a carrier, and you can potentially infect other people, but you are okay, and this is a common occurrence. And when infection and disease occurs, it's usually in the form of, say, pharyngitis, and this happens in school children. So you may have a class full of kids, 20% of them have streptococci, you put them together, they infect other kids who don't have the bacteria, they may get pharyngitis. We also call it strep throat. This is a rather painful throat infection. And if you get a throat infection and it's really hurting, it's a good possibility that it's strep throat caused by streptococci. The bacteria may also infect the skin and soft tissues causing lesions that are called pyodermas. You can see one here on the young lady's arm. Pyodermal infections usually require a break in the skin to introduce the bacteria, similar to the story with staphylococci. All right. So in the pharynx, you don't require a break, but on the skin here, a break in the skin, if you're a carrier, you get an infection. If you're not a carrier and you're unlucky enough to have touched someone who has streptococci on your skin, you'll get a pyoderma. It's spread from person to person, again, by respiratory droplets produced by coughing, sneezing, or talking, or by direct contact, very much like the staphylococci. Most of these streptococci remain localized, either in your throat, if you have pharyngitis, or on your skin, a pyoderma. But over the last 10 or 20 years, we have seen an increase in strains of streptococci that apparently can invade deeper tissues. And this is serious and a worrisome occurrence because these are life-threatening infections. And so the bacteria are not just staying in the throat or on the skin, but they're invading, they're moving systemically, and as you can see, all the different organs in this young lady can be infected, and these are serious infections. Group A streptococci produce proteins that promote spread of the bacteria. These are exotoxins that we've talked about before and include proteases that digest proteins in the host, which would normally restrict the spread of the bacteria. Hyaluronidases, hyaluronic acid is a component of the extracellular matrix. And this is digested by hyaluronidase. It loosens up tissues and allows the bacteria to spread. And DNases, there's often extracellular DNA uh, in tissues that makes it very thick and it's difficult for bacteria to move through this. They make a DNA which chops up the DNA and allows free spread of the bacteria. These bacteria also produce an enzyme called streptokinase. It's shown here in three-dimensional structure uh, of the protein. This enzyme converts plasminogen to plasmin. Plasmin, in turn, degrades fibrin. Fibrin is a component of blood clots, and it restricts bacterial movement. So this is another strategy that the bacteria have to move around the body. 
Bacteria also produce streptolysins, two different kinds, S and O. These lyse cells of various sorts, including immune cells that are trying to get rid of the bacteria. So you can see the value of that for the bacteria. And the, the bacteria also are very good at avoiding phagocytosis. Remember, macrophage-like cells are trying to take up these bacteria to destroy them. The bacteria have on their surface an M protein. It forms a dense layer on the surface of the bacteria. It binds complement and inhibits uptake by the, bac by the macrophages. The bacteria also have a capsule on the outer surface. This is another anti phagocytic structure. So it has at least two ways to avoid phagocytosis and destruction. Some of the more serious outcomes of streptococcal infections, in particular group A streptococcal infections, are non-superative sequelae. This means fever without pus. Now you remember an abscess is full of pus, dead neutrophils and other things, but there can also be uh, fever and infection without pus. And that's what non-superative sequelae means. One of the more serious is acute rheumatic fever. This is a syndrome that can occur from one to four weeks after the initial infection. So a, a child gets strep throat. And when you, if you have a child that gets strep throat, you should worry immediately and, and that this sequelae is going to occur, rheumatic fever, because it can be life-threatening way beyond the sore throat. So get the infection treated. This infection involves carditis, infection of the heart, polyarthritis, infection of many joints, chorea, subcutaneous nodules, and erythema marginatum. The inflammation of the heart is the most serious issue here. This can cause scarring of the heart valves. So these bacteria infect the heart, the, the valves get scarred, and for the rest of the child's life, they have heart issues because of this. And this can also kill them. It can be a fatal infection. Why does this happen? It happens to be an autoimmune disease. We make antibodies against the bacteria as they're growing in us, but some of those antibodies also recognize our heart tissue and begin to attack heart tissue and destroy it. This doesn't happen in everyone, and it's probably a consequence of your particular immune makeup, but that's why it's an autoimmune disease, rheumatic fever after strep infection with group A streptococci. Uh, another important Streptococcus is Streptococcus pneumoniae, a specific species of Streptococci, also known as the pneumococcus. This is a famous organism on so many levels. Here it is in this picture. It is usually cocci in pairs. And this bacterium was famous in, in research and medicine. In research, it's famous because it was used to show that DNA is the genetic material in the 1940s in a classic experiment. It's also famous because it's a very common f causative agent of community-acquired bacterial pneumonia, pneumococcal pneumonia. What do we mean by community-acquired? You go out in the community and you get it from someone else as opposed to hospital acquired, for example. So this is the most common cause of that kind of pneumonia. Over a million deaths every year throughout the world caused by Streptococcus pneumoniae. So this is a serious infection. There used to be many more, but we learned how to control it with antibiotics. Humans are the reservoir for this bacterium. Some of us harbor them and others do not. If you happen to not have a pneumococcus in you, and you are infected from someone else, you may be able to deal with the infection readily, you may clear it and never get sick, or you may develop pneumonia, lung disease. And the outcome really depends on many factors, including the genetic makeup of your immune system, whether you have any sort of disease that would predispose you to lung disease, such as another type of lung disease, or uh, if you're a smoker, this often uh, is a predisposing factor. And finally, we think that the strain of pneumococcus also makes a big difference. Some are virulent and others are less so. This diplococcus or pneumococcus is spread from person to person by respiratory droplets, very much like other streptococci. So again, a carrier here maybe doesn't have disease, is speaking with someone who doesn't have the bacterium, who may be older and compromised in some way, and that person can acquire the bacterium and develop pneumonia. So initially you inhale the bacteria, it colonizes your nasopharynx, the upper part of your respiratory tract, 
uh, and then it may replicate and spread down into the lungs and there cause pneumonia. Conditions that decrease your cough reflex are important for susceptibility to pneumonia. Coughing is an important way of expelling organisms in your, uh, in your mouth and nasopharynx. We also have something called a ciliary elevator in our respiratory tract. Our respiratory tract is lined with cilia. These are tiny hairs that constantly move and their function is to take any particles that you inhale and bring them back up again. So your tract is lined with these cilia and it's also covered with mucus. And if you inhale a particle, one of your reactions may be to cough and expel it. Another uh, thing that may happen if it's not very large is the ciliated elevator may bring it up, goes into the back of your throat and then you swallow it and it gets digested in your stomach. You do this routinely. Whenever you swallow, you're actually swallowing material that's come up from your respiratory tract. Some people spit instead. You know who they are. They're walking around the street spitting, which is kind of a gross habit. Better is just to swallow it and let it get digested. Anyway, if you smoke, you inhibit that ciliary elevator. You slow it down. And so that's why smokers in particular have more predisposition to respiratory diseases such as this, this one. The pneumococcus carries out a classic struggle with phagocytes. The phagocytes want to eat it. Of course, the bacteria don't want to be eaten. They want to multiply and survive to infect another day. So we have a battle between these two. The bacteria have a thick capsule that makes them resistant to phagocytosis. This is a nice illustration. Capsule makes the bacteria bigger and it also has specific chemical interactions with the macrophage. The host, on the other hand, has a protein called C-reactive protein, CRP. This binds the tychoic acid in the outer membrane, the outer peptidoglycan layer of the bacteria. Remember, tychoic acids are stuck into that peptidoglycan. If you don't remember, go back and listen to me talking about it on one of the earlier bacterial lectures. This binding of the protein to tychoic acid activates complement, which is a host defense system that can then lyse the bacteria. We can treat strep pneumonia infections. In fact, there was a time when they were uniformly lethal, but the development of penicillin shortly after World War I revolutionized the treatment of these infections and made people live who would otherwise die. But guess what? The overuse of penicillin and penicillin-like antibiotics has selected for resistant bacteria. And so now, if you get a pneumococcal infection, it's much harder to treat. Resistance involves penicillin-binding proteins that prevent the antibiotics from working. We now have vaccines that can be used to prevent infections. And there are two I want to tell you about. One is a pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine for adults. So if you are an adult and you were never immunized, you should get this so you don't develop pneumonia caused by this bacterium at an older age when your lung functions start to decrease. This vaccine will protect you against 23 different serotypes. There's also a vaccine for kids. You should give it to them. It's called the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. It contains 13 different serotypes uh, of pneumococcal antigens linked to protein carriers. So give it to your kids and they won't have to get the vaccine when they get older because they will be protected. So today we have talked about two kinds of gram-positive cocci that cause a variety of skin and systemic infections, the Staphylococcus and the Streptococcus diagrammed here. <music>